So my name is Karen Nalen, um, and I'm just going to very briefly int introduce uh, the session on uh, the initiative for open abstracts. Um, so if we have the first slide, yes, thank you. Um, and we're going to have a series of introductions from uh, members of the team that have been involved uh, in the initiative for open abstracts, as well as various stakeholders on the way. I will get out of the way um, and uh, just say that we'll have these presentations and there'll be an opportunity for Q&A. As always, please keep your uh, microphone muted. Um, feel free to ask questions or comment in the chat, um, as well as to use the Q&A functionality that we have. And on the next slide, um, there is the link uh, both to this slide deck and also um, some questions that we've put into an online survey format uh, in Menti um, just to get some information, some ideas to kick off the Q&A when we get there. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand over to the first speaker, uh, who is David Shotton. Who needs to unmute? Okay, welcome everybody. Um, we live in very unusual times, as I know you're all well aware. Never before has rapid access to scientific and medical discoveries become so critical. And thus, it is. Uh, there are powerful organizations around the world who have come to realize the importance of open science. Could I have the first of my slides, please? Um, here are three quotations, one from UNESCO saying that robust uh, science and uh, technology information systems are of crucial importance. Um, and thus UNESCO as the UN agency with a mandate for science is responding by advocating for open science. The second quotation is from the open science uh, authorities in Australia who say that uh, open science is important. The current system is not open by default. The COVID-19 pandemic catalyst has uh, finally laid to rest the myth that closed research as a norm is acceptable, um, either mor morally, economically or technically. And scientific advisors from various countries have been signing an open letter saying that there's a need for an emergency call for open science to make tools, data and publications resulting from publicly funded work publicly accessible. Um, and so this is the essence of open science. Stuff that we do, which is funded by the public purse must be openly available and not hidden behind subscription uh, firewalls. If I could have the next slide, what do I mean by open science? Well, in my view, open science has uh, four key aspects. Uh, I started off years ago as a molecular biologist and one of the things that was a norm within our culture was that our research data and our software would be published openly and shared with other groups who wanted to do similar work. Um, so open research data and open source software are two of the wheels of the open science four wheel drive vehicle. But that's about doing the science. We then have to publish the science and make it accessible to other people. So open access publications, research articles and other things um, are important. And it's become more recently realized that open bibliographic metadata is also important. And as we shall hear in from the subsequent speakers, uh, open abstracts are a very special component of open bibliographic metadata. Ludo 
Voltmann, who is Professor of Quantitative Science Studies and Deputy Director of the Center for Science and Technology Studies at the University of Leiden in Holland, is the leader of the initiative for open uh, ac uh, abstracts, the, the coordinator of what we've been doing. And I would like now to hand over to him to tell us about the initiative for open abstracts. Okay, thank you, David. Thank you for introducing me and um, uh, good afternoon or good morning to everyone. Um, so I'm indeed uh, very pleased to uh, give you a brief introduction into uh, what I4OA is actually about. Um, so the next slide will uh, show you um, um, an illustration of why we actually need open abstracts. So the initiative for open abstracts promotes openness of the abstracts of scholarly publications and there are many reasons why that is important and later on in this uh, webinar today we will actually um, go in uh, a bit more detail. My colleague uh, Aaron Tai will uh, also illustrate the importance of openness of abstracts. To give you just one uh, example, I would like to um, um, go uh, back to earlier this year at the beginning of, uh, of the current pandemic. And at that point, um, um, something important happened and also something that's actually uh, really from the open science point of view a really good and important development um, a so-called uh, data set um, uh, was uh, made available that is called the um, court 19 data set and this data set uh, makes available the full text uh, of all publications uh, dealing with COVID-19 or more generally with uh, coronavirus research. So the idea is that the full text of these publications is made available so that humans are able to read the full text, but also uh, to allow machines to uh, analyze and process this text and perhaps to algorithmically, uh, for instance, um, uh, find interesting connections between different scientific papers or to help humans in identifying the most relevant papers. Um, so that was a really important development that took place. So I would like to ask my colleagues to uh, go to the next step. Um, um, once more, please. Um, so what we did at my center at Leiden University, we started to take a look at this data set, this court 19 data set, because it is so important. Uh, we started to look at the, uh, at the data set to see what it actually contains. And in particular, of course, to see whether it was able to fulfill this promise of making accessible all the literature on coronavirus research. So this was the first thing that we started to do at my center is to check, to check the completeness and the, and, and the quality of this, of this data set. Um, and we found many positive things. We found that this data set is really a very, very valuable resource. Um, and it's, 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 it's a great effort made by a number of, of, of uh, infrastructure providers, a number of uh, data providers. Um, that have uh, joined forces to make this data, data set available. But we also found a problem. And uh, that is illustrated uh, in the, the following graph. So what you see is the following. We were interested to see whether indeed all the coronavirus literature is included in the data set. Um, and this initially turned out to be quite challenging. So our idea was that at least all the publications that mention um, coronavirus, COVID-19 in their uh, title or abstract um, should be included because these publications are clearly of relevance um, for the current uh, situation, for the pandemic. Um, but how actually do we find out which publications um, include these terms in their title or abstract. And this, we learned, was really more challenging than you would expect. Um, so we started by uh, trying out different uh, open data sources uh, in order to identify as much as possible all the publications uh, mentioning uh, coronavirus in their abstract. Um, 
but these, these data sources all have limitations. In the end, what we did is we used uh, Web of Science, a data source that I think most of you are familiar with. Um, it's a proprietary database that offers uh, a lot of uh, bibliographic data on scholarly publications, including abstracts. So we are in the lucky situation where we have full access to that database and where we are able to do large-scale analysis based on that database. So we linked the Web of Science database to this new data set, CORD19, in order to find out whether all coronavirus publications are actually included in this CORD19 uh, data set. So what we found is uh, shown by the green line in the graph. The green line shows publications that are included in Web of Science that include the term coronavirus, but that turned out to be missing, missing in the CORD19 dataset. And this is a quite substantial number of publications, um, especially in earlier years. So we actually found out that at that time, in April this year, the CORD19 dataset was not yet able to fulfill this promise that it was making, this promise of providing access to basically all the coronavirus literature. In, there were important gaps in the data set. We could identify these gaps because we at my center in Leiden, we are in the privileged position of having access to a number of proprietary databases, one of them being Web of Science, and being able to link all these databases to each other. Most researchers don't have this, 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 this uh, um, extensive access to this type of data, um, so most researchers actually would not be able to do this. So there only a very limited number of research groups worldwide that are in this in this in this privileged position where they are capable of identifying these types of gaps and in this case this was really a crucial gap a crucial gap in in an important uh, data set about uh, covid-19 and coronavirus research and it may well be that this gap would have uh, remained unnoticed for uh, uh, quite some time perhaps if we had not been able to uh, to do this uh, analysis of course what we want is to have a situation where it's not just me and my colleagues in Leiden that are able to uh, uh, identify these types of, uh, of gaps. Um, any researcher should be able should be able to do these types of basic checks uh, to make use of abstracts to make sure that um, all the relevant publications on a particular topic are identified. Uh, and that is what the Initiative for Open Abstracts is about and what we are trying to accomplish. So on the next slide, um, you see a, a screenshot from our website, and uh, this screenshot summarizes what the Initiative for Open Abstracts is and what we are trying to do. So we are a collaboration, a collaboration of uh, scholarly publishers, infrastructure organizations, librarians, uh, researchers, and a number of other parties, and we promote unrestricted availability of abstracts of scholarly publications. Um, in centralized uh, data sources, and in particular, uh, we look at Crossref as uh, one of the most promising infrastructures for making abstracts openly available for a large share of all scholarly literature. So this is the call that I4OA, the Initiative for Open Abstracts, makes. We make a call to all scholarly publishers to open their abstracts, the abstracts of all the works they publish, and where possible, so for all publishers that work with Crossref, um, we make a call to submit abstracts to Crossref to make sure that anyone in the world is able to have access to abstracts and to use them, for instance, for the purpose that I just mentioned uh, on the previous slide. So the next slide will show in a little bit more detail um, how this process actually works. So I will go through it in a step-by-step -step fashion. So first of all, uh, what you see here is um, uh, scholarly publishers. Um, so we see um, uh, a number of publishers, uh, but these are just examples. These publishers all publish articles, um, and these articles usually have abstracts, and um, these abstracts are extremely valuable for readers to discover the most relevant articles to read, for publishers to make sure that they properly disseminate uh, the work they publish, for authors to make sure that their work is read by the right people. Um, one thing that many publishers do is they make their abstracts available in all kinds of bibliographic databases. So that is visible in the next step on this slide. So we see that publishers 
submit their abstracts, for instance, to Web of Science, to PubMed, uh, to Scopus, all these databases uh, provide access to, uh, to abstracts um, and they get these abstracts from the publishers. Um, these databases are really extremely valuable resources, but they also all have limitations. Some of them are proprietary, um, you need to pay to get access. Others are uh, open, they have other types of limitations. PubMed, for instance, is, is focused on biomedical research. It doesn't cover uh, all fields of, of, of research. Uh, sometimes there are reuse restrictions. So while each of these databases is a valuable resource, they all have important limitations. So the other option that publishers have is uh, to make their abstracts available in Crossref. So that is what you will see right now. Uh, publishers are able to submit their abstracts to Crossref. So Crossref is an agency that provides digital object identifiers, DOIs, uh, for many publishers, uh, DOIs for, for the articles they publish. And in the process of obtaining a DOI for an article, publishers uh, have the possibility of making all kinds of metadata for these publications uh, openly available in Crossref. And the abstracts are one such metadata element um, many publishers work with Crossref, many publishers actually make all kinds of metadata elements available through Crossref. Unfortunately, uh, the possibility of making abstracts available in Crossref is uh, uh, not used by uh, a substantial number of publishers. So while this possibility exists and is uh, rather straightforward to use, many publishers until now uh, have not made use of it, which is a missed opportunity. It's a missed opportunity basically for all of us. It's a missed opportunity for publishers to make uh, their research more visible. It's a missed opportunity for researchers that want to read this research. Uh, it's a missed opportunity for authors for whom the research will get less visibility. So we are calling for publishers to make better use of this connection with Crossref and to make sure that they submit full metadata, including abstracts. And then the final step, and that's what will be visible right now on the slide, um, or perhaps you could click one more time. Um, the final thing that will then happen is that um, um, Crossref um, offers a rich resource of abstracts, abstracts that can in turn actually be used to enrich some of these other databases. Um, but the other thing, um, so I would like to ask my colleagues to go to the next step. Yeah, the other thing is that also all kinds of uh, um, tools can make use of this data, these abstracts in Crossref and other types of metadata in Crossref. So some of you may know the FOSS viewer tool uh, that is developed by, by my team, but there are many other similar tools that are very important that support researchers in all kinds of ways. These tools depend on the availability of this, of this data and Crossref is an extremely valuable uh, uh, resource for these tools, but this is all dependent on publishers properly making metadata, abstracts and other types of metadata available in Crossref. And that is what we are uh, calling for. Okay, the next slide will show you where we are right now. So this is the team of uh, organizations that uh, has founded the Initiative for Open Abstracts. It is a number of infrastructure organizations, so organizations that do the actual work of, 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 of uh, creating this infrastructure, but also very importantly, we have publishers, we have Hindabi, we have Sage and we have Royal Society, publishers that feel this is their responsibility to make abstracts openly available and to make use of, of, of uh, the infrastructure that is for instance provided by Crossref. And we also have a number of uh, universities and other research organizations that actually benefit from openness, openness of this type of, of, of metadata. So the next slide uh, shows us the um, uh, publishers that have already chosen to support the initiative. Uh, it's a mixture of open access publishers, subscription publishers, large publishers, small publishers. Uh, we have society publishers, we have commercial publishers. It's quite heterogeneous, but the good thing is that all these publishers have uh, recognized the importance of, uh, of openness of abstracts and have started to uh, make their abstracts available in, in, in Crossref. Uh, and later on today you will uh, you will learn more about uh, why publishers are actually doing this. So finally, I would like to show um, uh, uh, all kinds of other stakeholders that recognize the importance of this. Um, we have um, 
uh, research funders. We have uh, libraries and library associations. We have many infrastructure organizations and all these organizations recognize that this is important. Openness of, of abstracts and more generally of metadata is a really important thing. Um, and these stakeholders have all chosen to publicly endorse our initiative. Um, and that I believe really shows the importance of what we are trying to do. So that is what I wanted to share with you. Um, so um, one of my colleagues will now uh, actually uh, tell you more about um, where we are in terms of uh, openness of abstracts. So Bianca Kramer from Utrecht University will uh, 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 go with you through the details of, uh, of uh, the current availability of, uh, of abstracts. Yes, thank you, Ludo. And that will be indeed a lot a slide with a lot of detail. I apologize for the small size of, uh, of this graph. But what this graph shows is uh, information taken from CrossRef, showing for a selected number of larger publishers the proportion of abstracts um, they make available in CrossRef for current journal articles. So these are journal articles from the last three years, 2018 to 2020, so the recent journal articles, and the proportion of those that have an abstract in CrossRef. So you can see that already quite a number of publishers make a substantial portion of their abstracts openly available. And there are also still a quite a large number of publishers that don't do that yet, as Ludo already uh, mentioned. We can also see the supporting publishers of R4A, which are colored orange in this graph. And it's really nice to see that, um, yes, of, well, publishers that already make a lot of abstracts available, they support this initiative. But also publishers who don't yet make the abstracts available are already supporters. So, so we really hope to see over the next couple of months an increase in the number of abstracts. What's also important to mention, I think, is that um, it's not the case that for open, open access publishers, abstracts automatically get added to CrossRef. You can see a number of open access publishers that currently don't have abstracts in CrossRef. And that's because it's really an active step that publishers need to take to supply them as metadata. And Jenny Hendricks from CrossRef will tell a little bit more about that later in the webinar. So currently, a varied picture of uh, when you look at, uh, at publishers, those that do already submit uh, abstract to CrossRef and those that don't. When you look at the overall picture of journal articles from all publishers that currently have uh, abstracts in CrossRef, then currently it's about 21% of recent journal articles, so the last, last three years, that have abstracts in CrossRef. And you can already see that over the last year, uh, that has grown from 15 to about 21 percent. And of course, we hope to, to really have that increase uh, quite substantially over the, as we're going forward. Um, it's also notable that uh, the coverage is a lot better for recent journal articles. When you look at the back file, so older articles, the percentage with abstract is actually a lot less. It's possible to also um, submit or deposit uh, a back file abstracts, but um, so, but that also needs attention. Because of course, for the use of abstracts, it's as important to have the recent abstract as abstract of older literature. So that's the current state of abstracts, abstract availability in CrossRef. Oh. So, Ludo already mentioned uh, something about the benefits of this, about the use cases. And uh, for more about that, I want to give the word to, to Arante from Singapore, who will tell more about different use cases for Open Abstract and different stakeholders who can benefit from that. Oh, okay, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Aaron Tay. I'm an academic librarian in, from Singapore, and I'm one of the two academic librarians, besides Bianca, who, who is actually part of I408. And then go to the next slide, please. Sorry, next slide, please. And uh, I guess the reason why I'm in this team is that together with the other researchers, bibliometricians, publishers, and you know other interested parties, I believe fully in the promise of I408. And just to recap what I4A does, essentially it allows 
people to be able to easily access and use clean and well-formatted abstracts from a centralized source. So as Ludo mentioned, without I4OE, uh, without all these open abstracts in a centralized source like Crossref, uh, we, we basically, in, currently, we basically have to either extract the abstracts from expensive commercial databases like Web of Science, and in many cases, these are actually selective coverage, or we can try to pull from sources uh, like Microsoft Academic or by scraping abstracts from websites. In which case, you will get uh, you will get uh, abstracts that is often not as clean. So I, I'm of the view that um, I4OE and open abstracts would be of benefit to researchers. Oops. Yeah. Oops, sorry. Uh, of for researchers, whether they are doing text data mining or whether they are doing bibliometrics, is of uh, value to research administrators who are trying to track uh, the flow of research. And of course, to librarians who are looking for tools that can help researchers um, be more efficient in their research. Can I have an next slide, please? So, um, so one of the things about open abstracts is that for me, I see two ways in which people can benefit. The first way would be uh, the, the, the direct use of abstracts. So we have already seen in the field of biomedical field uh, that knowledge extraction is extremely effective. And this is because uh, PubMed and, uh, and uh, PMC exist. And because of that, we can already, already see it uh, being successful in terms of knowledge extraction of abstracts and titles. And I believe that with open abstracts, if we can get it at a high enough level, we can see easily, uh, we can also start to see the same advantages for knowledge extraction occurring for other fields as well, such as material sciences and other STEM fields. Uh, the other direct use of open abstracts is that for librarians or researchers who are doing uh, screening of papers for systematic reviews. Uh, so this is an obvious use case for librarians and researchers who need to actually quickly go through various papers, for example, like the COD-19 data set, look through for papers uh, that are of, of, of interest to them in their areas by looking through the abstracts. And lastly, uh, another direct use would be for administrators who are actually using tools to actually monitor the flow of science. And with more complete metadata, including abstracts, they would, this data would actually flow into systems like the tree systems, the RIM systems, and even in institutional repositories. Of course, not everyone will be using abstracts directly. Uh, but one of my interests has been to keep track of new tools. And one of the things I noticed about new tools in the last few years is that there have been a lot of exciting tools appearing. And a lot of them seem to emerge because of the excess of open metadata that's being released. For example, the I4OC, the, the uh, Initiative for Open uh, Citations, which is the sister organization of I4OA, has resulted in a lot of new citation tools appearing. Uh, I see a lot of new uh, citation tools like Citation Gecko, which actually make use of the free citations to allow our researchers to to actually uh, explore research, related research. Uh, I believe for I4OA, a similar effect will start to appear. As more and more abstracts are being made available, more and more tools will appear, and, and, uh, and this will actually help researchers actually be more efficient in their research. Even for existing tools, uh, many existing tools already exist that rely on open abstracts. For example, for discovery services, we have traditional discovery services like Lens.org, which allow keyword searches to more innovative visualization type of tools such as open knowledge maps, iris.ai, which all use open abstracts to do uh, discovery. And of course, Ludo, what Matt already mentioned about the bibliometric mapping tools, whether it's voice viewer, site space, and many other bibliometric mapping tools, which allow you to get, uh, which allow you to actually do interesting things like co-occurrence uh, co maps. And uh, the more open abstracts, the more open metadata you have, the more precise, the more interesting kind of maps you can actually produce. And of course, we are now seeing even more unusual tools start to emerge that rely on machine learning of abstracts. Scholarcy, which I'll talk about later, uh, is, a, uh, is also one of those tools uh, that, that has emerged. Uh, AS Review, which is actually a tool used for systematic reviews, where there's machine learning of abstracts and titles to learn uh, what, uh, what uh, to learn about uh, papers that are of interest to you and get the research. Uh, I only just touched on some of these use cases. Uh, for more, you can actually see this uh, medium post that I actually co-wrote with uh, Ludo Walkman and Bianca Kramer on the topic. Uh, 
Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So, I mean, I'm just a librarian and maybe you don't believe what I say, but uh, so let me, let me just quote from two, uh, two, uh, two people who are, in, who are doing startups. One is Phil Bush, who is one of the co-founders of Scholarcy. Uh, Scholarcy is basically a tool that tries to summarize the main findings of a paper. And when, we, when he learned about the i 4 a project, his first uh, reaction was that i 4 a would be very helpful to improve the efficiency of Scholarcy. Why? Because instead of scraping the abstract from the PDF, which may be inaccurate, you can actually now query cross drive directly and get the abstract. Uh, next slide, please. And of course, the thing to note, of course, is that right now we are still in a very early phase in terms of open metadata and, and open abstracts. Uh, if I'm not wrong, the amount of open abstracts that we have right now in cross drive is maybe around 20% or so for current journals. And as, as the amount increases, many, many more possible ideas might emerge. So let me just quote from Jason Prim. Uh, most of you know that he's, uh, he, he's the founder of Impact Story, now known as Our Research, and he's produced many interesting services such as Unpaywall, uh, Unsub, and uh, Get the Research. And his reaction was to i 4 a was basically, he, he thought that this was an amazing idea. And when I asked him, like, you know, so many amazing things, what are some of the amazing things that you can do? Off the top of his head, he came up with so many different ideas. You can actually see on, the, uh, on this tweet, right? I, I will read it all out. This, this just shows some of the possibilities that we have as more and more data becomes open, uh, including the abstracts, right? Uh, can I have the next slide? So, may, so let me just end by saying that uh, one of the... Uh, one of the things that uh, I think emerged when uh, i 4 a was announced was that there were a lot of questions about the uh, use of extracts and the and, and the, uh, the licenses involved. So I'm not a lawyer, so I won't go into all this. I, I think someone else will answer that later. Uh, Gini will answer for Crossref. But essentially, I believe that a lot of transformative use might possibly be usable. So uh, open extracts would be still useful in terms of tax data mining and some of the more transformative use cases. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Aaron. And uh, for now we'll be hearing from a number of publishers about their reasons for making abstracts openly available. So I'd first like to give the floor to Katriel McCallum from Hindari. Oops, apologies, I had problems unmuting myself. Thanks very much, Bianca. I may have the next slide. Um, so um, Hindawi has been involved in um, open infrastructure for a while. We're a commercial company um, and we are, uh, have a radically um, open agenda. So that includes open access, but uh, equally important, we think, is an open scholarly infrastructure. And this is especially true for um, doing research on research as Ludo and Aaron and uh, um, others have already um, indicated. Um, and we think that the infrastructure that enables access, reuse and discovery of scholarly knowledge, the pipe work, the metadata, the persistent identifiers um, and open metadata such as abstract and citations is at least as important for discovery as the text of published articles or any other research output. And to be a publisher and to provide publishing services, you do not need to hang on to uh, that scholarly knowledge. Uh, our role is not to be a gatekeeper to the exchange of scholarly knowledge, but a facilitator and a service provider. Um, and you can do that and run a business, whether you're a scholarly uh, 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 society or a commercial publisher or a not-for-profit open access publishers. And so the thing is, can publishers, whether commercial or not-for-profit, intrinsically align um, their interests, our interests, with those of the research community who really want to harness 21st uh, century technology for the benefit of science and society, and it needn't be at um, the expense. And more importantly, can we be as open-minded and collaborative in our approach to publishing and scholarly comms as we ask others, such as our authors and our reviewers, uh, to be in theirs? And so I'm going to leave you with a quote from Paul Peters, our CEO um, at Indawi. An open scholarly communications infrastructure should be built on and contribute back to openly available data sets. And this is particularly important for metadata about the research process itself. 
Having them freely available on websites is not enough. We need to have uh, a, a centralized open uh, system as Crossref does um, to enable this. Many thanks. Okay, next. Okay, next we'll be hearing from Helen Hughes from Sage. Hello, if you can hear me. <laughs> yeah, great. So yes, I really just repeating what Ludo said that from our perspective, um, improving discovery of journal articles was our primary aim in this and really facilitating easy discovery for researchers. Our authors, you know, write abstracts to every article and they summarize their research and in effect that's an advertisement to their article and um, they want people to read the articles uh, to read the abstract and find find them and we it's our responsibility to our authors to make those abstracts as widely available as possible and um, so it's it, really important for us to make sure that that we're on board with this initiative and um, you know sharing our abstracts with Crossref and um, what I wanted to kind of share today was 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 our goal at Sage as our intent to deposit um, and to, to tell all publishers that haven't yet signed up but that want to that really we're asking for that intent that we're not expecting everybody to deposit abstracts overnight or to have them um, shared really quickly necessarily but to have that intent so we started depositing our abstracts with Crossref um, for newly published articles from April last year and we're now aiming to get all our archive abstracts deposited by the end of 2020. Uh, the advantage for us is that we use Atapon for our um, Sage Journals platform. Uh, and Literatum is set up to allow the abstract deposit as part of Crossref metadata deposit. Um, and so they're managing it for us. Uh, but we have over a thousand journals and over two million articles on the platform. So it's quite a big task for us, obviously. Uh, so we're kind of queuing up that time with our Atapon team. Uh, who in effect have to redeposit all our article metadata in order to facilitate this. Um, so as I say, we're planning this uh, by the end of this year, uh, really encouraging all publishers to, to join us and to facilitate this easier discovery for researchers um, and for you know, more tools like Aaron was talking to, uh, to help researchers discover more. Thanks. Thanks, Helen. And finally, we're really happy to have Sarah Whelan from AAAS, uh, who we invited to also speak about their motivation to make abstracts openly available. Thank you, Bianca. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Whelan. I'm the Director of Business Strategy and Portfolio Management at AAAS. Um, I oversee the strategic framework and related um, project rollout for the science family of journals. Um, AAAS actually started making all their um, abstracts for all their journals open about two years ago. Um, the basis of that was um, we had multiple conversations going on. Um, the business unit was talking about course compliance and reviewing our metadata for that, while our editorial department, um, the senior management, was discussing interest in um, open abstracts and the benefits of that. Um, because of these multiple conversations going on at once, we decided to start up an open science working group that I lead. Um, that working group meets on a monthly basis and the goals are to evaluate tools, services, and initiatives that support open science through every stage of the researcher workflow. Um, and it's been very beneficial for us as a way of evaluating what to join, what tools to implement, um, and open abstracts was actually one of the first outputs of that working group. Um, and the reasons that we wanted to make um, our abstracts open are similar to what everybody else has said. Um, the top one being discoverability. We, you know, discoverability of our journal articles is our top priority. And then an, our second top priority is to make things easier for the, re, for the researcher. Um, and so to make it easier to find relevant research is also a top priority for us. And um, so this was basically an easy decision to make. Um, and then we started looking at um, deposits. And you know, as part of our course compliance, we're already reviewing our metadata, seeing what, you know, making sure, you know, seeing what data we had in our in-house submission systems and how that flowed throughout our workflow and into the cross-ref deposits. 
Um, and over the past couple of years, we've discovered just the benefits of enriching that metadata is very significant. Um, it gives us more flexibility, um, you know, as I feel like over the past couple of weeks in the various conferences, a running theme has been, you know, technology, how quickly it's moving from um, how to scale small to um, how to focus more on research outputs versus traditional article presentations. All of these interesting tools and, and services um, would be much easier to implement if we have a full metadata record. Um, and then also just it, it, it can improve workflows in the future. Um, just having that rich record makes things a lot easier. So it was kind of a double double benefit for us in that we would be helping researchers with open abstracts and we'd also be enriching our metadata deposits in a way that will enable us to innovate and implement tools and other services in the future. Thanks a lot, Sarah. So we've heard from a couple of publishers about the benefits of making um, abstracts openly available. But how to do that for all the other publishers who might be interested in doing that, how to go about that. And for that, uh, Gina Hendricks from Kossov will tell us more about that process. Hi, thanks very much. Um, yeah, so I'm Ginny from Crossref and I have a few slides just talking about how to go about it. There's been some chat in the, in the, the chat function about um, the reuse um, policies. So I will uh, go into that a little bit as well. Um, so on the first slide, I've got a diagram that shows uh, really the kind of world of metadata according to Crossref. So um, we have open APIs. Uh, we launched our REST API in uh, 2013 and any metadata that our members uh, register with the DOIs are distributed uh, through our open API search interface and things like that. And these are some of the uses and the types of organizations that use it. Um, a lot of them are anonymous. People don't have to um, uh, identify themselves to use Crossref metadata. And really that's the whole purpose of Crossref. Um, publishers are putting uh, metadata to register that their content exists so that other people can find and, and use it. Um, and it's also making the point that Crossref isn't the endpoint for metadata and for abstracts. It really is um, a facilitating like an exchange or um, a distributor. Um, so on the next slide, um, I go into how you can participate as a publisher. First of all, you need to be a member of Crossref um, and you ha have had the possibility as a Crossref member to include abstracts. Actually, since 2014, there was a specific board vote um, to allow publishers to share abstracts um, in March of that year. Um, and I also wanted to make the point that this initiative is um, choosing Crossref as a maybe perhaps an, an, an easy win, a start, because so many publishers use Crossref and so many organizations use the metadata from Crossref. But that's not to exclude um, uh, other repositories uh, and you know publishers are, are obviously putting their abstracts in lots of other places as well so if you're a data site member we would encourage you also to include abstracts with your data site DOIs. Um, one point to make as well is that there's no uh, custom distribution setting so if publishers are putting the abstracts in Crossref they are by default being distributed openly through our APIs and search interface. There's no possibility for, um, for a member to say, I want this type of um, distribution, but not this type of distribution. Crossref did have that a little bit in the past where um, some members could say, I want these types of organizations to get my metadata, but not these other types of organizations. Um, but we uh, cannot facilitate that and that's not a fair um, playing field. Um, so alluding to the uh, discussion in the chat, all of our members sign up to member terms. That means that anything they put into Crossref, uh, they are doing so for the purposes of, of distributing them. Um, there may be copyright held by the publisher or the author, um, and our open availability of the, of the metadata and the abstracts doesn't preclude that. So that is something to be aware of, and each publisher would have a different um, approach. Um, but as far as we know, we're not aware of any publisher who's sued anyone for using their abstracts so far. So I, I, I wouldn't blow this out of proportion, this issue. 
Um, and then on the next slide, more specifically, we go into, uh, if you are a, a Crossref member, you have a number of ways of registering this metadata, and including the abstracts with Crossref. Um, most common and by far used the most um, by most of our publishers and most of the content is just a direct um, XML deposit. And that means that <clears throat> uh, through the process you're already doing, you just need to include the abstracts as well. It does take a bit of work on the publisher's side, as um, Helen also mentioned. So people can't be just um, doing this instantly. They need to sort of work towards it and have a plan, uh, development roadmap. So um, we have seen uh, a lot more publishers doing this recently, and we're hoping that obviously I4OA will uh, accelerate this trend. Um, and abstracts are also one of the most asked for things by users of our, of our APIs. So another method, we have some online forms, the web deposit form, um, very simply named, is not currently accepting abstracts, but that is on our roadmap and it's coming soon in a couple of weeks, I'm told. Um, we also have a metadata manager, which is in beta, that's just for journal content. And we also have some plugins, most notably the OJS plugin and abstracts are possible to, to um, uh, you can deposit abstracts through that route as well. And then uh, I think my final slide. Yes. So this is where you can see progress for yourself and for any Crossref member. Um, abstracts have always been included in these 10 checks, uh, 10 recommended metadata elements. And um, our members, publishers look at this quite a lot. And I've given this example of the Royal Society, who's probably our most um, you know, with a member with the most with the richest metadata at the moment um, and they've worked really hard to get their abstracts up as high as possible um, so go to crossref.org slash members slash prep for participation reports and look up any member to see whether they're depositing abstracts with crossref um, and i will leave it there i think we're going to go to q and a next is that right Yes, I think that's right. Uh, a lot of things we already we talked about today is also all uh, can be read and viewed uh, on our website. So again, the, the website address. But without further ado, I would now like to switch over to Cameron Nalen, um, who can who will moderate the Q and A. Hi. So thank you for a series of, of questions already and a, a series of uh, comments. Um, on the, the Mentimeter link um, and a series of um, questions already arising. Um, so we'll try and either read out questions and get people to answer them um, or indeed we may try and, and bring you in. Um, so just to start with, and if you've got any other questions and popping them in the chat or the Q&A functionality, though I don't, it doesn't look like anyone's using the Q&A. So, um, so we'll focus there. So um, I think the question, the questions about text and data mining um, and the copyright issues are being um, addressed at the moment by people somewhat more uh, equipped to answer them than I am. Um, and certainly close, close, to the, close to those questions. Um, so does anyone have a, another question for any of the assembled panelists? Ah, okay, good question. Uh, what about preprints? Um, concerns coming on preprints. Um, does anyone want to take that from the panel? We have had it's it's, an, it's there's a there's a whole series of things to unpack there. No one's no one's volunteering. Uh, Ginny, Ginny's Ginny's jumped in. Yep. Sorry, I just re-muted you, Ginny. It's my fault. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're trying to shut me up all the time, Cameron. Um, <laughs> so uh, what about preprints? Yes, that is a great question. Um, at the moment, we, of course, uh, accept preprints through Crossref and have done for a couple of years. Um, they always include abstracts. Uh, most of our um, helper tools currently only take abstracts for journal content. Um, but any publisher that is... Um, uh, registering preprints with us and using direct um, deposit like HTTPS 
post can also include uh, abstracts there and they would be included in the in the APIs and search. There's been some there's been some analysis of looking at the the, the preprint contents and, and abstracts. And I think the one of the points is that um, some of the preprint repositories are using uh, data site in preference to cross reference a DOI provider. And of course, um, some of them like archive um, mm -hmm. and repex um, being mentioned are not actually involved with um, DOI registries at all. Bianca, did you want to add anything to, to that? I know you've done some analysis on this. Yes, I did. I was actually frantically trying to get that up on screen. Um, so maybe if you take the next question, then we can go back to the preprints and I can show the, the current status of uh, preprint abstracts. If you give me like two minutes. Yep, I can, but I think, I think the next question is probably something to do. <laughs> so go come back to you, Bianca. Um, so from Adrian Stanley, you see there's only 20% um, of articles with abstracts now. Is there more details in this? Is it older articles, certain types of content? Um, I would have thought more than 20% of publishers submitting abstracts now. Um, so I think there's a, definitely a, um, a bias towards recent articles um, and it's more uh, to do with um, journal articles than books. Um, those, of you, those of us who work with books know that books are always that extra bit more complicated than everything else. Um, and um, yeah, I think there's actually an interesting question. You said 20% of publishers. Um, so there's quite a few publishers are actually engaging um, with abstracts at one level or, or another. Um, there's always the question of whether you're talking about 20% of publishers by the count of publishers or 20% of publishers by the count um, of articles. And those are, those are two quite different things. And in this case, those 20% were 20% of articles, so total number of articles, so from all publishers. And of course, it matters a lot because some publishers publish a lot more, more articles. Um, so the, the, that 20% is really like looking overall. And yes, it does matter. It does matter for uh, publication type as well. We only showed articles now. For other publication types, it's uh, it's a lot lower. The other thing too that's good to keep in mind that um, this is actually journal content, and not all journal content will have an abstract. For instance, letters, editorials, or uh, book reviews, they often don't have an abstract. That's not distinguished in in Crossref. So for some publishers, for some journals that have a lot of this other journal content, they will not be, uh, they cannot be expected to, even if they uh, deposit all their abstracts, they will still not go up to, to 100%. So uh, it's really hard to distinguish that based on the, on the cost of data, but it's good to keep in mind that the maximum number of abstracts will not be 100% for every publisher. Yep. Um, so I think you just said that, that, that answers, yeah, Clayton's question. A uh, question from Thomas Crucial, I'll still pop to, to Ginny, because um, it's got a, a bunch of parts to it um, about getting a complete copy of the Crossref data on a regular basis, um, which I think Ed has just answered, but I don't know, Ginny, do you want to add to that? Ed's yeah, too quick on the I'm not a panellist, but he is being very helpful, so thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's not possible to get a complete um, uh, a data file every day. Uh, we did release one uh, earlier this year in the spring. Um, and because we were asked to by our members as uh, the COVID-19 crisis was escalating. So we did do that. And we uh, will look into doing that on a regular basis, a public data file. Um, and we hope to discuss that with our board. It would need approval in the next meeting or two. Um, you don't have to be a member to get daily access and updates from Crossref metadata. It's um, you don't even have to identify yourself. It's not restricted to members, so, though, of course, publishers are heavy users of, of that metadata as well. So they can link their references and stuff. Um, uh, we do have a, uh, a paid for service. Um, and with that, one of the um, sort of special services um, and features is a monthly snapshot of metadata. So that is that is possible to sign up and do that. It takes quite a lot of processing power to produce 
the full metadata in XML and JSON every month. And it takes about five days to do that. So we're, we're not able to do that every day. Yeah, I, I will add to that, that a Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative, we are, we are a Metadata Plus um, member and using using that data and using those dumps, which is really convenient um, for us. Um, we have we have played with doing the, the constant updating and cross reference It's just a lot of data. <laughs> Um, but it can be done if you want to go. If you, want to go back. <laughs> you might not. You might knock out the service for everybody else. But yeah, it can be done. <laughs> Any other uh, questions? I'm just going going back through. Um, so we talked. There's, so lots of people are, are are interested in these questions of copyright. I think it's fair to say um, it would be really nice if we could just resolve all of the questions that everyone has about copyright. Um, that's, you know, we've got to take the steps we can once one step at a time. Um, but I think there's a fairly clear indication there around um, what the expectations are in terms of, of use. And I guess I would add that certainly uh, text and data mining is clearly a, a transformative use. Um, I am not a lawyer. This is legal advice, but you can get a lawyer to point you to the relevant case law. Um, on TDM as, as, a, as a transformative use in most jurisdictions. Um, I don't know, Bianca, if we could move across to the, to the Mentimeter, um, if, that's, if that's feasible. Yeah. Unless I uh, want to circle back to the preprints real quick before oh, we do yes, it. Sorry, yes, the preprint. Yeah. So I'll try and um, see if I can share my screen again. So can you see now a similar graph as you've seen as you saw before, but now for preprints? Yeah, great. So this is uh, this is actually done last month, uh, taking uh, all the, the preprints or all the material in Crossref that's labeled posted content, which for most publishers is mostly preprints, and looking for the percentage of abstracts. And you can see for many preprint servers they already deposit um, all of the abstracts. Uh, in Crossref. Uh, in this case, the orange ones are the ones that deposit with Crossref, the blue ones are the ones that deposit with, uh, with DataSite. So it's Zenodo, Fixshare uh, that do, deposit abstract and ResearchGate that doesn't. So it's a small number of uh, preprint servers that don't yet, and the majority does. Uh, it will be quite interesting to, um, to have a talk with them to see if they would be willing to, uh, to also submit abstracts. So I personally think it will be really enriching to also have access to um, to, pre to abstracts of, uh, of preprints. Yep, thanks for that. And yeah, if you've got any further questions, keep keep adding them um, to the chat. Um, we've had a bunch of, of feedback uh, to the two questions we posed in the Mentimeter. Um, so we posed two questions. Um, uh, which were in the first, um, what benefits do you expect from open abstracts? Um, I don't know whether we can get those up or not. Yeah. Okay, well, maybe for this, uh, I would ask you to share your screen because yeah, I'll, I'll share my screen. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let's find the right one. Um, yep. So we have as a, as a theme, um, very much discovery um, is a theme that comes through here, um, but also using and being able to, to access this content at scale. Um, it's about accessibility, it's about um, new kinds of functionality, so publishing them together with reviews um, to make the reviews better. Um, the mention of translation has come through in a couple of, a couple of contexts, and also to build um, these better systems out, uh, uh, the, the research information systems, the knowledge graphs and, and maps of content, um, and the current research information systems. We also posed the question, I'm not sure how many people got, got through to this, you know, in what ways will you support open abstracts? Um, and here we've got a, a group of people interested in um, making sure that the content they're working with um, is available in this form. Um, also questions about um, creating other sets of, of abstracts I'm imagining. 
uh, help with dissemination and reinforce the signal, which is absolutely fabulous. Um, and um, and using licensing to maybe signal some of those things more clearly. And again, yeah, that the, the ability to use this content in other contexts, um, such as making maps um, or discovery systems for knowledge. So, got a um, couple of other questions, um, which I think we might try and answer in the chat, but if I can um, pass on, I think to the, to the final speaker, um, we return to, to David Shotton um, to close us up. Right. Um, thank you very much. Thank you to everybody who has uh, attended this webinar. Uh, we hope it has been a benefit to you, uh, has been stimulating for you. Uh, I want to conclude uh, just by illustrating how open abstract and open bibliographic metadata more generally fit into the open uh, science scenario. If I could have the next slide. What I've done here with apologies to Tim Berners-Lee uh, who developed the uh, semantic web layer cake is to propose the open science layer cake. Um, each layer of the cake builds on the one below. So we have to start with open and accessible data. Data which is uh, recorded with persistent unique identifiers so it can be found and referenced and made available in the next layer through open publication infrastructures of various sorts. They make available open publications built on the data, scientific reports primarily um, based on research results. And describing those open publications and making them available are open abstracts and various other types of bibliographic metadata saying where it was published, what its DOI is, who the authors are, what their uh, ORCID identifiers are and so on. And once we have a volume of open abstracts and open bibliographic metadata, then we can develop open analytical tools and applications to analyze and work over and extract knowledge from these facts. At the moment, analytical tools, which are very valuable to universities and to funders to see how their researchers are doing and uh, where it is wise to spend research money, um, are often uh, controlled by commercial interests and there's a, a very active movement at present to develop open analytical tools. With the results from such tools we get understanding and as a result of that understanding we can reach informed decisions and, and conduct uh, proper decision making based on evidence and that uh, as I started is, is enormously important in the present epidemic uh, for evaluating uh, trials of vaccines and so on and so on. But it's also enormously important for scholarly endeavor as a whole and scientific endeavor as a whole. Next slide. So where do we go from there? Each of us has a role to play. And so I would address different communities uh, attending this webinar in turn. Publishers, show that you're committed to open science by opening your abstracts and other metadata. Journal editors, urge your publisher to make abstracts and other metadata openly available. Publishers respond to pressure from journals. Libraries, you will be negotiating with publishers for subscriptions and other things. In those negotiations, insist that the publishers make their abstract and other metadata openly available. Some years ago, I wrote a, a paper uh, encouraging funders to mandate 
that uh, abstract, uh, the, sorry, that citations, reference lists from publications were made openly available. And there has been a steady, if slow, uptake of that. I, I now suggest that funders should require and mandate publishers to make abstracts and other metadata openly available as a precondition to funding uh, APC charges. When these things are available, infrastructure organizations can acquire them and uh, serve them on to end users. And I would instruct infrastructure, uh, encourage infrastructure organizations to deal only with publishers who do not require you to pay for access to the abstract and other metadata from their publishing. And then finally, authors and reviewers, the, the, the uh, academic in the street, um, we are the, the, the originators and the end consumers of uh, all of this stuff. We do the research, we publish the research, we use other people's publications to inform our own decisions about what to do next. So when choosing the journals to which you submit your work, and for which you perform peer review, probably without payment of any kind, take into account whether the publishers make abstracts and other metadata openly available and be selective of the journals that you, you honor with the submission of your work and for whom you perform these peer reviews. Next slide, please. So a final thanks to all of you for participating and particularly to the speakers. Um, let's not leave it there. Be sure that as a result of this webinar, you change how you work and what you do, that we actually move the world forward as we can do to a world in which abstracts are by default open and that is the norm. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, we have another concluding slide. I would just remind you that much more information is available on the I4OA website. The URL is there. Um, follow us on Twitter. Um, contact us through openabstracts at gmail.com and let's make this a vibrant community, um, not just the few of us who have kicked off the initiative for Open Abstracts, but a larger community so we all get involved and take this forward. Thank you very much indeed.